Today, an amazing article was posted on FrontPageLinux.com. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of fantastic articles posted on FrontPageLinux.com all the time. It's a great website for news, tutorials, articles, videos, and much more. Here's the thing, though. FPL contributor Eric Londo wrote an article about the history of Unix and Linux. And it's just... Wow. That's the best way to describe it. Wow. I'm making this video to let you know about the article, and also to show you some cool stuff from the article. A couple of things I didn't know about, even with my over 20 years experience using Linux. The article is titled, A Guide to the History of Unix and Linux, Everything You Need to Know. And once you click that link, you'll see that's not an exaggeration. It's everything you need to know. And this article inspired me to make this video to let you know about six cool things that you could find in this article about Linux. Hi, I'm Michael Tunnell with the Destination Linux Network, and on this channel I make a bunch of different types of tech videos, from free and open source software to Linux-based operating systems, gaming on Linux, and just all-around tech that I think is cool. So if you're interested in that, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified when I make new content. So here's six cool things that you didn't know about the history of Linux. Gaming is at the core of Unix's origin. I've had plenty of people over the years send me messages about how gaming is, is not important to the ecosystem of Linux, is not important to what insert whatever, and I couldn't disagree more. I think gaming is a very important thing for the Linux ecosystem for a variety of reasons, but mostly it's a compatibility thing and also an innovative uh, progress type of structure. So those who say they don't watch videos that have gaming in them or they say that they stop watching my my podcasts when I get to something about gaming. Well, I think that's unfortunate because maybe you you personally don't care, but you should care at least for the overall scheme of the platform because it is very important. So much so that it is at the core of the reason why Unix even exists. So now I'm going to read an excerpt from the article about this piece. So number one, Ken Thompson started Unix because he wanted to play a computer game at work. In 1969, an engineer and systems expert at AT&T Bell Laboratories found himself without work and quite bored, as the project that he and his team had been working on, the Multix, or Multiplexed Information and Computing Services Time-Sharing Operating System, had crumbled before his eyes. In the time planning his next pursuit, Ken Thompson found himself creating and playing computer games on the company's expensive GE635 mainframe which he had access to from working on the Multics platform. One of his games that he loved in particular was space travel. However, fearing that his, his use of the mainframe would be looked down upon by his superiors, Ken decided to attempt to port the game to an older computer he found in Bell Labs, a Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, PDP-7 that was basically left abandoned as it was already considered an obsolete machine at the time. In order to port the game to the more efficient and less expensive PDP-7, PDP Ken Desai designed his own operating system, which drew heavy inspiration from the Multics project. While still having access to the Multics environment, Ken began writing a new file system and paging system on it. From here, the beginnings of what would become Unix was born. So not only is gaming important to the overall ecosystem of Linux, it's also the core reason why Unix was even started. So number two, Slackware is the longest running distribution of Linux. And I've seen people say that a lot of the time. But what I thought was kind of cool and a little bit funny is that the, the amount of people who like tout that being the biggest thing about Slackware is kind of leaving out something very important. It's only the longest running by two months. The other distribution that came out less, actually less than two months later, was Debian. So it's only longest by a little bit of time. And so let's just jump into the excerpt. So in July of 1993, Patrick Volkerding decided to rewrite part of the SLS code base, which is from SUSE, to forge his own Slackware distribution. Debian, less than two months later in September, did their initial release. 
Both Slackware and Debian blew up in popularity very quickly among the small but burgeoning open source software community. In fact, SUSE began selling its first commercial Linux product in 1994, a modified version of Slackware. Which is kind of funny because Slackware was created because they didn't like what SUSE had done, and then SUSE decided to use what Slackware made. So that's pretty awesome. Let's move on to number three. Number three is a fun one because Unix was referenced in the classic awesome movie in 1993, Jurassic Park. So in this movie, there's a very famous line that was said that is... It's a Unix system. I know this. And this line basically created a trend of sorts. I don't know if it really is the initial thing. It's just the most popular one that gets credit for it, but... It probably, it could be, I don't, I don't know, but to create a trend where Hollywood, whenever they reference technology, they just exaggerate everything and also get it wrong on purpose in some cases, or just purposely make it the most absurd thing ever to make it look cool. And this phrase also became inspiration for a subreddit that was created that is pretty fun. It's r slash, it's a Unix system. On the subreddit, it's described as a subreddit for every over-the-top, embarrassing, and downright, flat-out, incorrect usage of technology found in movies, TV shows, and video games. You should definitely check out that subreddit. It's fun. There's all kinds of nonsense. I saw one video, a TV show where they were like, this is the GPS satellites, uh, intricate uh, schematics, and blueprints, and it's a, it's a Raspberry Pi. Of course it is. So basically, Jurassic Park created this trend of... Over exact, I don't know, it was, it's credited, it's credited to create the trend of over exaggerated technology in Hollywood, and Unix is a part of that. And you know what? It actually kind of looked, if you look back at the movie and you look at how it looks in the exaggeration, it kind of reminds me of Minecraft. So, were they just exaggerating or were they predicting the future of Minecraft? Yeah, they're, they were exaggerating. <laughs> So number four, we're going to talk about how the Linux kernel got its name and how the name it would have had would have been a little bit worse. So I'm glad this happened. Let's go to the excerpt from the article. Linus didn't care for the name Linux as he thought it, would, it sounded too egotistical and instead opted for the name Freaks, F-R-E-A-X, a combination of the words free, freak, and X to pay respect to its Unix roots. However, when Ari Lemke... Sorry if I messed that name up. A volunteer system administrator at Helsinki University of Technology was asked to host Linus's project on their FTP server FunNet or FunNet. He felt the name Freaks wasn't appropriate and named the project Linux anyways. Eventually, Linus consented to the name, and that's how Linux got its name. Linus didn't want to use the name. Someone else decided that he should, and he was like, All right, okay. I think it's just funny that it's such a fundamentally important thing. And he was like, well, that's better. You're, you're right. It's okay. I'm good with it. <laughs> and it was better. It was way better than Freaks. So good job. And thank you very much for doing that, Ari. Speaking of names and how we got them, let's talk about how Red Hat got its name for its company. And it's not as cool as you want it to be. So maybe consider changing the origin to like, yeah, yeah, we meant this, we meant this. <laughs> in early 1994, Ewing, Mark Ewing, named his creation Red Hat Linux. After a time, he wore a red Cornell University lacrosse hat given to him by his grandmother while attending Carnegie Mellon University. He released the software in October of that year, which in what would become known as the Halloween release. In 1995, Bob Young, the owner of ACC Corporation, a business that sold Unix and Linux software and accessories, bought Ewing's business and merged into Red Hat Software, the company, and then which made Young became the CEO. This is a very interesting thing because it essentially says that the reason why Red Hat got its name Red Hat is because Mark Ewing wore a hat that happens to be red. I always, when I first heard about the name of the company, I always thought it was something to do with like hacking, computer hacking stuff, like black hat, white hat, gray hat, and then it's like on the other side, it's like the corporate enterprise approach because it's the red hat. I don't know where that came from, why I thought that, but it's not that. However, as a suggestion to the Red Hat team, 
Let's go back and change the Wikipedia to say that's why. Because that sounds a little bit cooler than just because the hat's red. <laughs> the sixth and final thing we're going to talk about in this video is the original license for the Linux kernel wasn't open source free software. It actually had a commercial uh, restriction on it. Let's talk about that. Go to the excerpt. When Linux was first released, Linux had placed a more restrictive license than the GNU GPL or general, general public license and didn't allow for commercial activity to utilize the Linux code in their proprietary software. However, Linux began to realize that a kernel wasn't really useful without you know, other things to accompany it. In order to grow his operating system, Linux decided to re-license re Linux under the GNU GPL v2 with the 0.12 release. This proved to be one of the most important decisions made by Linux in the early days of Linux. After the relicensing, GNU engineers began working on the Linux kernel in order to make it compatible with a wide range of extremely useful GNU software packages. This allowed for the fully functioning operating system to begin being distributed freely. In addition, the open nature of development allowed people from all over the world to contribute code to the Linux kernel, offering a diverse view of architecture and functionality and allowing for the code to improve and iterate much more quickly than operating systems built by a single proprietary team. I think this is an interesting topic because it shows that, you know, if you want to increase the momentum of something, open source is a fantastic way to do it. And the Linux kernel decided to do that because they wanted to, because he wanted to get more people involved and make the kernel a much more important thing. And in doing this, making it open source, made it more possible for more people to use it, more people to contribute to it, and for it to grow just exponentially. So if you're not aware, the Linux kernel is the biggest open source project, period, by far. It is gigantic, and it is proven to a lot of companies, enterprise and software developers and just publishers and so many different types of companies that open source is viable. For a very long time, open source was considered like anti-commercial or whatever, but it never really was that. And, you know, there's also the argument of free, free software versus open source. That's a whole other thing. But anyway, so I'm an open source advocate, or as I like to refer to it as an open sorcerer. Yep. You can use that if you want to. It's a great term. I like it. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has ever used it, but if you want to, go ahead. So... This is a just a fantastic example of when you switch to open source, when you switch to free software, then you can do so much as a community. And that is why I created the Destination Linux Network uh, to have a, a big community-based structure and have open source be the core component of the philosophy of the network. It's because I want everybody to be involved and everybody to treat the network as their network because that is the same philosophy that I want to deploy because open source is so important to me and open sorcery is important to the world. So there you have it. That's six cool things that you didn't know about Unix and Linux and we didn't even get past 1994. That's how much really cool stuff is in this article. You need to go check it out. It is awesome. And to make it easy to find the article, I have it linked down below in the description. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it useful and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, then be sure to smash that like button and destroy that subscribe button and just annihilate the bell so you get notified of new content being posted. Oh, you like the shirt? Yeah, it's the Linux is Everywhere shirt. It's a shirt I designed to convey the message that whether or not you know that Linux is there, it probably is. And if you want one of these yourself, then you can go to the DLN store by going to dlnstore.com. There you'll find this shirt as well as a bunch of other stuff, including mugs, hoodies, and stickers, and all sorts of stuff. So go to dlnstore.com to check it out. Thanks again for watching, and remember, always try to keep an open mind, and always try to use open source. I'll see you next time.